Come yeah, on. I have some other stuff that I'm going to record, but this is it. We're going to take mm. this interview. We're going to put it up. I've been excited about this conversation um, for a bit. So I've been bothering everybody else with my thoughts. And um, so I'm glad to get you on. And I've been bothering yeah. you with my thoughts, too. So yeah. it's been a beer, man. <laughs> so it's Pastor Sean Powers. So I looked this up earlier from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Now, how far is that from Des Moines? Uh, about two and a half, two fifteen. I, I was born there, but I was raised in Dubuque. Okay, which is another hour away. It's on the Mississippi River. Is that rural city? Eh, Dubuque, the the Dubuque no, air quotes for the those of you listening. The Dubuque metro, okay, uh, metropolitan area of Dubuque. You know, hundred thousand or something like that. So, okay, you know, I, I didn't. I never felt rural rural going up. Not like not like where we're at today. You know, right um, outside of Des Moines here, but yeah. I grew up in town, in a town, however you want to define that. That's the funny story because when I, when I tell people about meeting you, so we meet yeah. at Apex, North Carolina. Yeah, that's right. We're at the assembly, yeah. and I assume here's a guy from the Midwest, probably ultra-conservative, came from ultra-conservative family, you know. I already know how our <laughs> conversations are going to go. And it's like, no, you know, he uh, lives out there, but his background is not that. And, and that was yeah. the one thing I never asked you. So, like, I know you went to Southeastern Baptist for seminary. Yeah. Um, you went to St. John's University. Yeah. But then I assume you also went to the Pastors College no. for Sovereign Grace. Oh, you didn't go to that one. No. So undergrad was Northwestern and then seminary in North Carolina, uh, Raleigh-Durham, but Wake Forest, technically. Okay. So the, so the Baptist Seminary and then moved back to uh, Minnesota uh, because I had left Iowa at that point. And went to St. John's University, which is just northwest of the Twin Cities. So I was commuting there, working um, full time. Had, had our first kid, um, Chloe, and uh, that was a hectic time. But did a THM mm -hmm. there, focused it on early church history. Uh, that's just an area okay. of history that I've really dialed into over the years. Uh, something I love. So yeah. Okay. Pastors no. College, man. Okay, I just assumed all you guys in Trinity uh, at some point in the past went to the Pastors College. Yeah, you know what? It went down like this. Uh, when I landed in at time before Trinity, Sovereign Grace Church, they're like, hey, we want to send you to Pastors College. And I'm like, no, I just finished a THM. <laughs> and that was the end of it. And, and I'm unapologetic about that because I had spent the previous eight years of my marriage you know, in school. My wife had faithful to follow me, and we weren't going to make another trip. And then there was no disrespect mm -hmm. to the Pastors College per se. Right, right. At all. Um, I've only heard, you know, a lot of, I've heard a lot of wonderful things. But um, it was a decision I made for our family. Okay. And and I don't think we've ever talked through this, though, because you're at Redemption Hill, and you guys were planted how long ago? Four years, October 28th. So okay. Two, so 2018, October 28th was our first service here in the Des Moines Metro. So two years there, then a trial by fire with COVID. And then yeah. now here you are with the Tom Selleck mustache. Yeah. And uh, – <laughs> So really quick, walk me through that. How did you get into church planting? I mean, was it your, the church you were in was used to it or you just I'm felt just glad you didn't ask, uh, how how did you get into the mustache? I don't know. I'll ask that offline. <laughs> For the record, my wife likes it, period. That's all that That's matters. why I have it. Yeah, I don't even like it. Uh, yeah, you know, back in seminary. So uh, maybe back up a little more. The Lord saved me in my early 20s. So I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Um, I grew up in a, a very liberal, uh, democratic, socialist, Catholic, Irish Catholic home, which all those terms put together into a blunder seems like, how does that even happen? But it happened. And then um, Lord Lord saved me in my early 20s. And then I just went on a journey, reading my Bible all the time. You know, you get you get Wayne Groom's Bible doctrine, even you know, yeah. that, like everyone else, you know. Same here. Yep. And then, you know, you hear the word church planning. You're like, is that even a thing? You know, like I had no idea. Mm -hmm. um, Catholic churches generally, you know, within our culture, Malou, don't church plant. So that kind of language right. didn't exist. Um, and then I went to seminary and realized, whoa, this is um, a big deal to a lot of people. And um, I joined a group of guys informally on campus that um, – they got together like once a week or something like that, and they would go through a church planning book together and just talk about it. Why? What's the methodology behind it? How would we do it? And out of that group, most of the guys went to plant churches. So which is kind of cool. An informal thing within a formal institution was going on. 
kind of uh, sparking um, some thoughts and, you know, uh, and then some hearts were like, yeah, God's calling you to do that. So I didn't do that at a seminary. Um, okay. There are a lot of good reasons for that. I wasn't ready. I was kind of an immature punk when I went to seminary. Uh, and I acknowledge that in retrospect. I actually acknowledge that pretty quickly after seminary. And I got into the corporate world for several years. And that was better than seminary in many ways. In that, I began to be like, you know what? Am I going to live out my Christian faith within this culture? You know, am I going to be making a difference for Christ at my job? And uh, what, I, what I discovered uh, during that, and I you know I'm getting a long way to answer your question, but it's going to make an impact on our conversation today. What I discovered is just being a Christian in the workplace, all of a sudden people were coming to me with their problems left and right. And I was able to make an impact right where I was at. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't doing anything flashy. I wasn't like, you know, giving a track out, but here's, you know, seven steps to, you know, whatever. Right. The Romans road or whatever. I'm not saying that stuff is necessarily bad. I think they're okay within their own context and time and whatever else. Right. But I was just trying to little lowercase p pastor people the best way I mm-hmm. could within that context to care for them, to love them. And so during that time, also was uh, doing that THM, a Master of Theology at St. John's University in early church history, really focusing on that. Uh, eventually, and so no, no church planning is on the brain, really, at all. Some guys had asked me if I'd be interested, took a... Took a um, like, a, what do you call those quizzes or whatever? The assessment? Assessment test or aptitude yeah, yeah. test or whatever it is. And they're like, yeah, you're not ready. And I'm like, fine. I never really thought I was ready anyways, but you're the one who put me here. So here we are. Right. You're a warm body. You got a seminary degree. Um, and so I never really took it seriously until I got into pastoral ministry and really probably three, four years after getting into pastoral ministry. So the Lord calls me into pastoral ministry. I'm on staff. Loving what I'm doing. Um, I was pastor over youth and uh, singles, so college and career age, and then also mm. missions. Mm. And then about two and a half years into it, someone had asked me the question, hey, would you ever want to plant a church? And I'm like, no. <laughs> I, we just right. bought a home six months ago <laughs> in the neighborhood of where the church is located. Right. Makes no sense. <laughs> But, but, but when people ask questions, people, people like you, if you would ask me a question, Hey, would you consider this because I know you and you're a friend and a person I care about, I would take the request seriously and take Mm. it to the Lord in prayer, you know? And so the person who would ask the question was not a random person, uh, a person that, um, that I'm like, you know what? We have a relationship. I'll pray. And so I began to pray. And then over time, the Lord just began to work in my heart. Like, yeah. I am calling you to plant a church. Now, I didn't know where at the time. It didn't. It wasn't in me like, oh, Des Moines. Uh, I what I did know is that I'm a Midwestern boy. Um, you know, I spent some time in the Southeast for three years in seminary, and I've been all around the world traveling. Oh. I've been all around the United States, been part of different. You know, I, I have at least uh, some understanding that there's more outside the Midwest. You know, right? But I I knew that I was a Midwestern boy. And that um, this is kind of my people. Maybe you feel the same way about Philly, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know the city. You know, more broadly in terms of geography, I know a Midwestern boy. And so one day I was in my uh, pastoral office praying, and I had a map of the Midwest open. And then it, and the light bulb went off. Like, why would I go back to Iowa? Why not go back to Des I'm not, I'm not from Des Moines, but why not Des Moines? It's the biggest metro area in Des Moines. Right. And I began to pray about that. And I asked the other elders in the office and I'm like, Hey, would you ever consider this? They're like, we never even thought about Des Moines because we're flyover country. So who would think about Des Moines? You know, right? you, you think Midwest cities, you know, you do the ten, Tim Keller, Mark Driscoll model. You, you go to mm-hmm. Chicago, you go to the Minneapolis St. Paul or whatever, which I got mm-hmm. so many different thoughts about that model. Um, but I'll table that for another day. Okay. And um, unless you ask me a question about it. And so, you know, I, I knew there was one hurdle to get to Iowa. It was my wife. Mm. And uh, you've met Sharice. Yes. Uh, she, she's the smartest person in every single room. And uh, she could, she's, the, she's the most intellectual person in every single room. And so I knew that 
if she in her head was not going to want to go to Iowa, we weren't going to go to Iowa. <laughs> so right. I, when I approached her, I'm like, Hey, what about Des Moines? She's like, no. And part of that is a perception issue of Minnesotans. We're like the rednecks to all Minnesotans, you know, Iowans. Yeah. And so uh, what I knew, what I knew is that this was not going to be an intellectual debate between her and I, I'm not going to throw down the, I'm the head of the house. You must follow me. Um, right. It's a horrible way to operate. Right. In marriage. I began Absolutely. to pray. I just began to pray, pray that God would change your heart. And you know what? God did. And we took a trip here. And I remember we're on 35, Interstate 35, going back to the Twin Cities after a short trip here. And we're not even to Ames, Iowa. And she turns to me and she says, I can raise a family here. And it was at that point wow. I knew we were going to plant a church um, in the Des Moines Metro. So there are, there's a lot more to that story. And I probably took up way too much time telling this part That's of the okay. story. But um, – that's how we got to the Des Moines, Des Moines Metro. And uh, I was telling a guy I met yesterday, kind of in our neighborhood, neighborhood in the country, but down the road here. Mm. And I was telling him, there's no other place I'd rather be. We are so thankful that the Lord brought us here. We love our church family. We love Redemption Hill. We love the area that we're in. And uh, we just feel very blessed by the Lord and very eager to do the work of the Lord here locally. Now, I want to I ask something else, but I, I, I want to summarize, though, because I think you hit on something important for men who consider church planting or any any type of leadership. You brought mm -hmm. up two things. Number one, you talked about talking to the elders at the church you were at. Yeah. It sounds like you had a pretty um, submitted relationship that you were you were actively involved relationally. Um, and you, you look to the elders as counselors and not as opponents when it came to church planting. Um, there was that, and you seemed like you also were waiting on God. Like, it's not mm -hmm. just, Hey, I got a job offer. I'm out of seminary. We need money. You know, let's go. Yeah, it's more yeah, like, yeah. Hey, let's, uh, I'm going to pray on this and I'm going to see what God does in your heart. Mm -hmm. Um, because your wife is, is in a real way, your barometer, you know, to kind of see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there's two things there. I think that's important for many men who would lead a household, you know, are there other men that I can turn to as counselors? Um, that I can talk to. It's funny because one of the things in my intro notes was I was going to say, you know, Sean is one of the guys who if I had to call somebody at two in the morning, um, I would I would call him. Like he's one of those guys where I feel like I can yep. call um, primarily because it's only one a.m. where you are. If it's two a.m. Yeah. for me, so you might yeah. be up. But I'll pick it up. <laughs> there is a there's a process there though mm -hmm. where you were submitted before you were sent. Is that yep. fair to say? It is fair to say, and it's good to think about these things in teams and submitting myself to other men. Uh, in this case, it was other men on the pastoral staff. Mm -hmm. um, I knew uh, one thing I, I really feel strongly about is that the, one of the, the best model for planning a church is for to, to be sent out of a church. Absolutely. Yes. Now, now we can say that there are other models that exist depending on culture and context. And I would say yes. And amen. You know, we, the missionary who goes overseas, it's just a very different way to plan a church, you know, yeah, I think in the United States, generally speaking, you're able to have that um, submissiveness when you, when it's a local church who's saying, yes, this is part of our identity and we're going to go do it. So we're going to send out one of our guys, you know, one of our pastors. And we know with that and in this case, about 20 people came with us to Iowa. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. And a lot of people you've met um, when you came mm -hmm. to Iowa. They came with. And so that's a hit for the church in a very worldly sense. But when you back up and you talk about kingdom work, it's mm -hmm. a win all the way around. Yes. And so when you're sent out of a local church and that part of the identity of that local church is church planting, the assumption is, yes, there is submissiveness, submissiveness kind of baked into the cake. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And I think what I observe is church planters are usually a little different than some of the guys you'll see in an established church. <laughs> there's this, and, and I took the assessment. The funny thing is there was one area that I did bad in. And I remember another guy, um, Watson Jones, who I think is at Compassion in Chicago now. He said, um, you know, they have a certain cookie cutter template and the way they assessed you, they just didn't know you were black and in the ghetto. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> and he's like, no, bro, listen, you know, and he helped me identify, um, how I was living and how I, everything was evangelism for me, but I didn't call it evangelism. Um, I was shepherding, counseling, everybody outside of the church. 
and wanting them to get to church. Yeah, you right. know what I mean. But I, I could, I could relate, and I was like a chameleon. I could fit into any room. You know, I had done a lot of sales in the background. I was a director of sales yeah, somewhere. Sure. But I fit in. I'm naturally inquisitive about everybody. I yeah, usually same. have to reel myself in from not asking too many questions because I got to watch. I don't know if I'm offending somebody. Yes. Yeah, and the one thing I, yeah, I noticed about you, you're able to, you know, you're a guy who could probably, you could plant and bring in university students mm -hmm. or you could bring in some elderly folks. If there are people who have questions and are wrestling, I think yeah. you do good with that. And like my first night out in Iowa, you know, we're all talking and um, Sharice is there. We're talking about the 5% nation and the <laughs> beliefs and Wu-Tang and all that. Yeah. And you can only have that conversation with certain people in evangelicalism. Yeah. And, and I think something about you disarms people. For example, this is something I loved. Your sermon yesterday, hmm. you started it with a preface and, and you said to everybody, um, if I remember right, you know, some of you are probably going to disagree with this mm -hmm. and, and I want you to, and, and I want you, I'm trying to remember exactly what you said, but the idea was basically um, feel free to disagree and test everything I'm going to say by scripture. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how you should approach it because Sean is fallible. God is not. Uh, right. you, you remember? That? I, yeah, I do. Break down what you know. What what led you to say that? And then I think I get it, but I want other people to hear. It's a rare thing for a pastor to say that. Yeah, you know, I was I was reflecting on that particular uh, statement later in the day after I I had preached, and I mm -hmm. realized occasionally I I make that kind of preface. Not every Sunday, right? Um, but when I know that I'm bumping into a particular text that um, that that already has multiple interpretations by good people right good right. people we're not we're not talking about heresy we're talking about clear theological dis, di, uh, um, differences uh, right. between people so the text was i think this is helpful context the text was matthew 6 verse 10 mm -hmm. and right now we're going through the sermon on the mount and uh, we do expositional preaching we generally go pretty slow uh, not all the time. Esther was, you know, quick, but that's a different genre. Uh, right. In the Sermon on the Mount, here we're going really slow. We're probably about twenty-three sermons into it, and we're in Matthew six ten, and right now we're in the Lord's Prayer, so we're going extra slow through the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. And so the text is, "Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven." It's that last phrase, "on earth as it is in heaven," where I know there are multiple interpretations, and this gets us into eschatology. Now mm -hmm. we're not, we don't have time to throw down like all the eschatological position in the nuances and stuff. But that was generally speaking where our mind naturally goes. And that's how we begin to try to discern. What does that mean? What does it mean for the will of God to be mm -hmm. on earth as it is in heaven? That has eschatological implications. Mm -hmm. So if you're pre-mill, amill, post-mill, those are the categories that we now have in our, in our um, you know, systematic theology books. I, what I was trying to articulate is, listen, I know that s some of the things that I'm going to say, um, you may disagree with, with me, and that's okay. And the reason why I'm comfortable in saying that is, one, I think shepherding creates a culture of conversation in the church. Yeah. Uh, with, too many times I've seen pastors say, thus saith the Lord, and them being the Lord. Yeah, and, and, absolutely. And, and listen, I think pastors should be educated. You should be well thought out. You should have conviction. I'm not talking about squishy convictions, but right. what I am saying, you, sometimes it takes discernment to realize, just wisdom to realize we're, we're bumping into something that isn't definitive for our faith, mm -hmm. but there's clear distinctions and divisions in our faith. And eschatology is certainly one of those categories. We're not talking about you know, the Trinity here. We're not talking about... Right. Um, the, you know, talking about the humanity and divinity of Jesus Christ. We're talking about eschatology. So that's why I gave that preface. I wanted people to have the freedom. And here, here's the other thing I would say about that. And this is why it's good to be a part of a confessional church. Define that, please. Yeah. So Trinity Fellowship Churches, which Redemption Hill is a part of, is a, it's a confessional denomination and we are a confessional church. So our confession of faith historically runs back to the 1689 um, Second London Baptist Baptist Confession of Faith. If you're right. like, well, I've never heard of that. Think Westminster, but you're Baptist, right? And so mm -hmm. uh, that's that's a little bit of our theological identity. If you ever mm -hmm. read a Confession of Faith, you just just pick one. It could be the Westminster, it could be the could be ours, it could be Heidelberg. 
the theology is deep and the theology is wide. And so I know that when I make a statement, you can disagree with me on this, meaning also within our confession of faith, we allow for various views uh, to, to a degree. They're like, they're like the banks of a river. You have these two banks, and we're staying within the banks within our confession of faith. But within right. these banks, you might be pre-mill, you might be ah-mill, you might be post-mill, but we're all within the banks. Now, could there be a point that within these three different theological systems of eschatology, a person kind of jumps out of the water and gets off on the bank and it's outside our confession of faith? Certainly. That certainly mm-hmm. could happen. But generally speaking, as long as we're inside the banks and we're all flowing down the same raft down the river, we're cool. We're cool. It's fine. Now, wait, Pastor Sean, what about, you know, all I need, you know, I only got one book in my library is my Bible and no creed but Christ. And, you know, we don't need all that because that was written by men. What do you say to that? <laughs> yeah, it's like I have a blog for you. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I wrote I wrote several blogs on confessionalism. It, um, in part, um, it was a building off of a paper that I had written and submitted to Trinity Fellowship Churches regarding what it means to be confessional. And here's what I would say. Actually, here's a great way to put it. I, I said this to a bunch of seventh and eighth graders today. You are all theologians. That's right. You're all theologians. You might not think of it right now, but by the time we're done at the end of the year here, I want you to think to yourself, you're a theologian. Right. What's being said and communicated in that is that when you read the Bible, you're doing theology. And what we're deciding to do and being confessional, you know, so everyone's doing theology. What you believe about Jesus is theology. What you believe about um, scripture is theology. What you believe right. about you know, uh, Christ himself right, is theology. We're all doing theology. We're just choosing to write it down. And, and frankly, we're being really honest about who we are. We're, we're to make yourself say, very accountable. Yeah, what I say at our church is we don't hide the ball. We right. don't hide the ball about what we believe confessionally. And, and frankly, Eric, we talked about this, man. Mm-hmm. It drives me nuts. You go to... You go to XYZ Evangelical Church down the road, just vanilla as all get out. And you go to their website. It's like, these are the 10 things we believe. Yeah. They copied and pasted it from ABC <laughs> Church down the road. And they copied it from some another church down the road. And you know what that creates? Lazy thinkers. Yeah, absolutely. It, it creates lazy thinkers. And uh, we need a, we're going to, I mean, I know you have a heart for this and I do as well. We need to equip young men, young boys to become men, young girls to become women and to think well about theology, think well about the application of theology for their lives. Yeah, what most don't understand is that there is there is doctrine and, and, and many answers to questions that other people thought about mm-hmm. when they did creeds, catechisms, confessions. Um, I've gone to a couple of churches that were not confessional, but I've read everything. I have mm-hmm. right over here, the uh, Bibles with creeds and confessions from Crossway. Because um, yeah, yeah. it was amazing if you have this index of scripture that you could refer to. Um, and so if you're a man, um, whether you're just leading devotional at home, you're trying to learn, you're trying to catechize your children. Mm-hmm. These are things you should take seriously because a lot of times what churches will do is they'll, they'll abandon the idea of being confessional so that they could have the power because right. they'll say, this is coming from the Bible and it can mean one thing today and another thing tomorrow. Just mm-hmm. like many people change up the focus of their messages before George Floyd and then after George Floyd. Correct. And what was prosperity gospel before George, George Floyd is now mm-hmm. something different about justice now. And, and people go with it because it feels good. But in a sense, you've basically got the same drug dealer giving you the same hero, heroin, yeah. but in a different bag. Yeah. And so when we're talking, go ahead. No, what you're, what you're aiming on is, you know what, when you, when, you, when you are a confessional church, when you work with a confession of faith, Truth becomes fixed, fixed upon exactly. you know, it, it's leading us back to the word of God, right? Right. It, we're not doing theology as if like we're disconnected from the word of God. Actually, no, our theology is from the word of God. And that is, a, that is a foundation of truth to your point, uh, whether it's before 2020 or after 2020, nothing's changed in terms of what we believe. Now, if something has changed, you know, from what I believe regarding the confession of faith and I need to find a new church, you know, but that's, right. a, that's again, you used the word earlier. It's called accountability. Yes. It's accountability. And I, I've told our folks, listen, you, you can, I said this earlier, you can judge me based upon the word of God, but also you can hold me accountable according to our confession of faith. Our folks know that. And you know what? That's pretty humbling. 
Yeah. And, and it, it is also, it's helpful for the life of the church because you have something that you can refer to and, and kind of equip your people with. Like you yeah. and I have been talking, and I think one of the things that we lack in many of our circles is the ability to take complex problems in society and think deeply. Not to say that there are clear answers in all of scripture for them, but in terms of training our thinking, you know, if, if we really believe what Paul wrote to Timothy and we believe that, uh, you know, the word of God is God breathed and it is profitable for our instruction, for correcting us, for training us up, that we got to take it seriously beyond just our daily bread or reading a little bit of verses every day. And so like, even with eschatology, and that was the whole kind of purpose of this call. One yeah. of the things I thought about is we debate eschatology a lot and we get to all yeah. the books yep. we either get the movies or we refuse to go see the movies but the one thing we don't is apply the text the way the author wanted us to apply the text right. we'll fight over first thessalonians 4 but we yeah. forget when paul gave all this regardless of how you interpret um verses 13 18 he said i don't want you to sorrow as others who have no hope so if i fight with you over what happens from 14 to 18 and forget that the application is hope I've missed the point completely. Yeah. And and I think about, you know, I years ago, I went through divorce care, going through horrible divorce. And everybody had a psalm that they hold on to. You know, right. certain scriptures that encourage them. Rarely have I seen people who grieve and are hurting cling to um, anything having to do with Christ coming again, anything yeah. having to do with eschatology. And we'll, we'll have to define that word soon. But yeah. I think what we're saying is we live in a complex era of time. We need yeah. people, every level, mothers, fathers, workers, preachers, who think deeply, wrestle with things, and read across the spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. I've read Westminster. Um, my daughter, Chloe, was catechized, I don't know, from like six to nine in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. I didn't have anything else. And then they did New City, yeah. and I said, well, I'm not starting all over because this is old English, and that's all she <laughs> yeah. knows. So want of conformity is what she knows. But if we take it seriously, we got to take this stuff seriously. You know, I want to be able to define myself based on, you know, the creed that I, that I, whether it's Nicene Creed or Apostles Creed, right. I think, um, and, and, and for a man, I think that's attractive. Yeah. If he can articulate his positions and his studies of the creeds. And it also, for you, I think you speak very, very securely. Like you're not worried about people challenging you. It's almost an invitation to come grow with me, come talk with me. I mean, you said something. Um, again, in your sermon, and I think you were quoting Rob Chisholm when he talked about Jeremiah 29, um, and I was yeah. going to quote Doug Wilson, if I could say that name, um, but Rob said, you know, if you're a believer on earth right now, you are home, yeah. and Doug Wilson says something similar, that if I go to heaven, I'm just passing through, you know, we forget this is our home, you know, we, we think so much about getting to heaven which our picture of heaven is just this disembodied babies playing harps, wearing huggies. That's really boring. <laughs> and really, I, as a kid, I hated the idea of heaven. Yeah. And so now this robust idea, like you said, heaven, you know, is closer to the Garden of Eden than that it seems. is to what we think contemporarily speaking. Um, and so I really like how, how you kind of dealt with it. And you can speak on that if you want, but I love that. We, if you're a Christian, you are home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I I would say, and I don't know for sure, but I'm gonna I make the assumption. You know, Rob says that, and I took it from him. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned Doug Wilson; they have actually probably different eschatological systems. I think yeah, Doug Wilson, Post Mill. I'm not sure where Rob's at. I would guess Abel. You know, but they're making a similar point that's really critical. So whether you're Abel or Post Mill, it's that God has us in this time and space for purpose and for a reason. And we are to steward and care for whatever God has given us. Um, regardless of what you think about the world affairs, there's things going on right here and, and right now in God's mission. And are you going to get on his mission? And this is kind of something I said in, in, you know, in that sermon. Or are you going to do, are you going to stick to your own little puny system or mission, right? It's all about you and what you want to do and what you want to accomplish. That's so stinking selfish. Honestly, it's so, and that's part of the problem with, with, with men, right? They, and mm -hmm. people in general, we think selfishly. It's mm -hmm. about what, what do I need to do? What do I need to accomplish? What do I, 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 right? No, it's about God. And so whether, wherever you fall on the spectrum, eschatologically speaking, that point's really important. 
God has us home. We're here. Sean Powers is in the Des Moines Metro. God has me here. This is my home. You are in Philly. That is your home. Therefore, what are we doing with the time right now to be about the business, to be about God's business, to see the people reached with the gospel, whether that's how we speak or whether it's people seeing your good works and they glorify God, Matthew 5, 14, or we can you know, cross-reference Ephesians 2, 10. Right. Um, so, so it's, it's, it's word and deed. It has to, it, we have to be doing things as well. That's become almost a cliche thing because it's like preach the gospel, well, do good works. And, 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 and I want to stop and define yeah. some of that for a minute because – so when we talk about eschatology, um, most people think of eschatology as, you know, the doctrine of last things or the yeah. end times, right? And when we think about different theological positions on it, now I come from a place where anybody listening to this that comes from my background knows nothing other than premillennialism. And they don't even know – they may not even know, and no disrespect. I'm just saying that's where we came from. They don't Same here. know the term premillennialism. They know rapture, right? Yes. And so the idea being that Christ came, died for sins, uh, lived a perfectly obedient life, died, is resurrected, and begins the church age in the book of Acts. And from Acts on, we have this era of grace, right? Mm -hmm. And then one day, this era is going to end when Christ comes back. He's not going to physically touch the earth, but he's going to come in the clouds and there's going to be this resurrection where Christians, you know, from ages past will be raised. All of us will be caught up to meet him in the, the air. Body. Exactly. And yep. then for seven years, we're with him. And then there is uh, tribulation and suffering yep. on the earth. Um, some people believe that there's a rapture during the midpoint of the tribulation. Yep. Yep. Then Christ comes back for the second coming. And then there is a 1,000 year reign on the earth. Satan is bound for a thousand years. And during that time, people have children, they're born, there are people who will fall away. And then, you know, Satan gonna, is released. Hey, listen, listen, are you yeah. gonna bring out the charts and maps now, please? <laughs> well, no, it's, I, I have them, but no. I know. But, uh, and I had plenty of them that I used to use to try to, to teach from, right? And, and what I'm getting, I don't wanna jump ahead too much, is how you see eschatology. Um, is going to shape how you think about the world and what you see on the news. Mm -hmm. And in a way you can become very Benedictine that mm -hmm. the world is dying and going to hell. We need to get our souls right. We need to be holy. We need to give out chick tracks, yeah. share our faith. And I will say there is a sense of urgency in sharing the faith for, for many that I've known who believe any moment Christ is going to come and you yeah. want him to catch you working. Right. That's this pre-millennial <laughs> dispensational view that there's a rapture coming. Right. Yeah. And and then you can help me define some of the other points. And I would I would think that there are really those three main camps, pre-millennial, amillennial, I want to say it's slow for people who want to look it up, and yeah. post-millennial. Right. Um, I become quite familiar in times past with post-millennial. Um, you know, that idea that kind of saying how, here's how revelation dates and here's what happened you know, before 70 AD and right. the beast being, um, was it Diocletian? Um, you're the one who knew church history and all that. And so this idea that there's not going to be a, res a, a rapture the way we understand it and that we're in the millennium now mm -hmm. um, and that Christ is reigning, right? And what has, what helped me, and I know I'm getting beside myself, but for years I wrestled with and studied when will Jesus return and debated it, right? Right. And many times we don't think about how is Christ reigning right now? Mm -hmm. Because that is a big heart issue because if Jesus is reigning um, and it is efficacious, then therefore the church has a role in that, right? If he called us right. to just resign and step back, that's one thing, right? right. Just, just prepare for me to come. But if there is a work that he's doing, um, that's something we're going to be a part of. And so I, I, I assume that you at one point were a millennial. Like I still want to define these positions, but I want to see where you were. Yeah, so I think back up a little bit and say eschatos is the Greek for basically last things, you know, eschatos, mm -hmm. eschatology, things like that. Ology usually means the study of, and you go to the kind of the front of the word, and it's like theology, you know, theology right. is the study of God. So that's what, that's what we're talking about, big picture-wise. We talk about like your systematic theology book. Mm -hmm. You know, my this goes back to just my general way that I, I shepherd a church. Um, I'm always willing to evaluate my positions you know, on some yeah. of these things. There's things that are, that are, that are certain, you know, my view of the Trinity, my view of, of Jesus Christ, the, the, the work and person of Jesus Christ, a lot of that's fixed. That's just good Orthodox Christianity. And there's some things where I'm always willing to like, ugh, I gotta, I gotta continue to dig. I'll look a little deeper. Yeah. 
And so when the Lord saved me in my early 20s, I read the Left Behind series. Like that was my introduction to eschatology. Me too. And then you get to mm-hmm. Revelation, you're like, dude, what is going on here? I don't understand. You feel like you're left crying. I'm like, I'm just going to go back and read the Gospels. Right. <laughs> you know, because it's like even parts of Daniel, you're just like, what? Um, and so I, I assumed um, in part because of Left Behind series, honestly, and then the church that I was a part of, which was a pre-mill church. It was one of those churches that didn't say it, but they oh. were. And uh, and that's fine, you know. And uh, I got a lot of friends who are pre-mill, and I love them, and whatever else have you. And then, you know, something began to shift in seminary. And then I been was introduced to Sam Storms. Oh. I was not introduced to Sam Storms because of his positions on amillennialism. But it was his charismatic reform positions, which I would say yeah. I am a continuationist and I'm reformed. Yeah. Not just, not just my soteriology, but reformed Baptist and almost every sense of what people think about that. Mm-hmm. And so I'm, um, you know, it really helped me understand how to interpret revelation. Um, helped me understand the genre, like the, the genre matters and the genre helps dictate some of these imagery, the imagery of, of revelation, how we interpret it. And that was really, really helpful. And in more recent years, probably in the last two and a half years, I've been reading more about post-millennialism. And I I can't say intellectually honest, in in an intellectually honest way, I'm still wrestling with what, quote, camp I'm in. I tend to think I'm in my own camp in some, some respects. Okay. That sounds crazy. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know what that means. I don't know. Someone else can figure it out. You can. I'll take it though. You can do an Enneagram check on me. I don't care. Whatever. <laughs> okay. Get off my lawn. Um, but there are certain things in scripture that I've been beginning to see that fit neatly into a post-mill camp. And it's this idea of mission, this idea that this is our home, this idea that um, God has me here for purpose. And I should be, I should be about God's business. I should be active in my faith, not only holding to what is true, but but doing those good deeds, which God prepared for me beforehand, Ephesians 2.10. And so I've been thinking a lot about that. And as we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, right? What does it mean to live distinctly before God? Which is really, I think, Jesus giving us a, an exegesis of the Old Testament law. And so I have opinions about that, you know. And so what I push back against, and I saw a lot of this within the pre-mill camp, but I but I don't want to overly generalize. But what I've seen a lot of, and some Amel folks are like this too, more of the pessimistic Amel. It's like, you know what? I'm just going to put my feet up and wait for Jesus to come back. That's right. what I'm called to do. It, yeah. It's going to burn. So what does it matter? Right. And, and that, and I said, yes, yeah, I think court time of this recording yesterday when I preached that that's a terrible way to live. It really, mm-hmm. I don't think it's biblical. You can hold a pre mill view, by the way. And live biblically. Um, yes, absolutely. So let be clear there. But what I said is like, that's just a terrible way to live. And a post mill view certainly pushes heavily back against that in a massive way. Nope. God has entrusted you with qual- with specific tasks. Now get to business. Go ahead. You're going to say something. Yeah, I was going to say, now let's define it for a minute. I want everybody to follow us. Sam Storms is a voice uh, for our millennialism. He has said himself, he doesn't like the term amillennialism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. He always says, up until a certain point, this was post-millennial. So, so far, we've talked about pre-millennialism. That's that's, right. that's our rapture, folks. Tim LaHaye left behind. <laughs> yeah. Um, Sam Storms would say, uh, you know, amillennialism, Christ is reigning in the hearts of his people. Uh, mm-hmm. how, how would you say if you summed up amillennialism from the Sam Storms camp? Yeah, you know, so uh, Christ is reigning in the hearts of his people. That's a certainly a, kind of a, a statement we could use. Also, a very symbolic interpretation of revelation right mm-hmm. so it's it's taking revelation it's a uh, um, apocalyptic work and so you treat it like an apocalyptic work so so like the pre-mill camp it's very literal and this is all of our dispensationalist baptist folks and you, you mm-hmm. know there's just as many in our area than they are in your area in terms right. of those who hold the, the view so that's a very distinct interpretive difference that's hermeneutics right. now, right? And so the hermeneutics you employ into Revelation, when you get to Revelation, impact your theology, then sometimes impact certainly how you live. And so those are the distinctions That's right. there. And then the, the debate between all three camps is what do you do with the millennium? What do you do with Revelation 20? 
we're not going to have time to settle that debate here. Right. I, I would encourage Don't people. Don't bother. Yeah, I would encourage people, though, to, to YouTube, um, just put into Google uh, or DuckDuckGo or whatever you use, Eschatology, John Piper, Doug Wilson, Sam Storms, mm -hmm. and Jim Hamilton. I think yeah. I've watched that. It's a two-hour debate. Yeah. It's a very helpful debate. And I got to tell you, I've, I've watched it three or four times, maybe five. The first time I watched it, I was a pre mill the second time I watched it, I was Amil. And the third <laughs> third or fourth time, whatever it was, you know, I'm something else, you know. Right. And uh, really, really helpful. It's really, you know, everyone's poking holes and, and they're going back to the Bible to try to understand Scripture. The mm -hmm. post-mill view is a little different in yes. that it, there's this belief that God has, it's not just God is reigning in our hearts, but it's what we do with our lives. And where, to a degree, ushering in the kingdom. Now, this is a really, really important statement. All three views, at least from a, a orthodox, conservative, I'm using the term theologically conservative, perspective, all believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's right. I say that because there are liberals, theologically liberals, uh, who believe in postmillennialism. But they're stripping away the second coming of Christ. And so this is how we get quickly to social justice movements. And I mean that in, the, in, in not the kindest way, right? That we are about the business of doing good, but to what end? To what end? Right. Right. Jesus ain't coming back. So what are we doing it for? Well, then, then the end becomes very personal it's because I think it's the right thing to do. And so God, right. God effectively within liberal post um uh, post millennialism removes god out of the picture and so hence we have social justice movements and not what i would what i would call biblical justice movements right and to 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 sum some things up for people what i want them to hear is not um there's these different camps and nobody knows who's right what happens is there's there's different people applying a method of interpretation to mm -hmm. revelation chapter 20 to maybe Revelation 12, to 1 Corinthians 15, uh, uh, 50 through 50, 58, right? And they're interpreting a certain way. But what everybody needs to understand is there is a message that all of the authors were getting to beyond just at what time does Jesus come and, you know, is it Harpazo and are we going to be caught up, yeah, right? right? In a sense, every camp is a justice movement. Right, mm -hmm. even the liberals, because they're yeah. approaching how Christ is going to bring final justice to earth. But then, how do we go about bringing about justice right now? So it's absolutely important, you know. And so, if, if you had any Christian sit down right now and tell me how do you interpret Revelation twenty, it'll probably tell you a lot about how they see the whole Bible, right? right? In, in the world, and, and, yes, exactly. And it's so important because this is where our hope is, our confidence. When 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 life hits you hard, and it will. And mm -hmm. things fall apart and people fail you. The church isn't going right. Money's not going right. You got cancer. You lose a parent. You lose a child. Um, you need more than just the, the, the old hymn or just quoting, the Lord is my shepherd. You don't know what it means. I'm not saying scripture is not going to be helpful. Right. But you need the assurance. And you need to have walked with the assurance that Christ is coming back. But right now, he's, he's reigning. He's working. And all of this is a part of an unfolding plan. And it doesn't mean it takes the pain away, but what it does mean is I, I see and I worship Christ differently. The mm -hmm. point of scripture is to bring us to a God who loves, reigns, gives justice, gives hope, and gives us way more than we ever deserve. Yeah. Um, and so if Jesus is reigning right now, I can give him my trouble, my pain, my hurt, um, because he gives me a reason to worship. And we've got to learn to read the scripture doxologically. I think Paul modeled that for us, right? And And so... You know, you kind of said it in your sermon. Uh, you quoted Kevin DeYoung, which we'll have to have another episode on what you disagree with. But Kevin DeYoung said, he, he's, you know, in terms he's of, an amillennialist for the record. Right. Kevin DeYoung. Yeah. And, and I like him. I like his sense of humor. Oh, yeah. He's yeah. an amillennialist. Um, mm -hmm. and, and in other words, amillennial and postmillennial, there is no tribulation in the sense that the premillennial have. There's right. no rapture. Right. Um, there's no thousand years on earth while Satan is bound. Right. And yet, all together, we can we can all kind of look at it and ask the questions. And I, I think I agree with you. Postmillennialism looks at right now, if you look at the justice issues we have, I think the reason we have such a big theonomy camp and the reason we have such a woke camp is because people didn't know scriptures to begin with or didn't have a good hermeneutic method. And they said, where do we go? Somebody said, go to the Old Testament. 
And because if you look at it, both movements are really a lot of Old Testament scriptures right. being applied or, or misapplied. Yes. Right. And I like yes. the questions being asked. I love that part. But if you if you got to go to the Old Testament and stay there and you can't come to Revelation and you can't come to Thessalonians, now something's missing from your theology. And so what I'm arguing is we, we need to be equipped. And wherever you are, you need to wrestle with it. And what I think you're modeling to your congregation is if you got the essentials, you can change your position and you don't have to be ashamed of it. No, you do know, you and. And, and also, I would say there's good people in all these camps, you know. And mm -hmm. I, I do think what you what your theology does, you know, um, tells you to live a particular way, you know, what you think mm -hmm. affects how you behave. But I want to be very clear: like, I there are good people who are pre mill, on mill, post mill, who we can have these debates. That's why we need to invite the dialogue and not shut it down. I, I would argue to some degree that dispensational pre mill. <laughs> I got a lot of bag. I got a lot of concern about that. <laughs> but, but the, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, heretics are ever. I'm just saying, like, that's the most troublesome for me personally. But, uh, you know, this is like historic pre mill. Like, oh, yeah, I get it. I get, I get what you're coming from. I get why you get, why you get to where you get to. I don't think we should treat the Bible like a math book where we have to do all, do all this math to get to an eschatological yeah. position or whatever. But I, I get at least your at least your your nose is in the Bible. The the, the, the thing though that has pushed me away from a pre-mill view is this. Do I think optimistically or pessimistically about the world around me? Mm. And let's think, let's make this really clear, man. You and I've talked a lot about what's going on in the streets of Philly. Yeah. And the heartbreak you're experiencing because of death, right? Mm. Injustice. And, and you look at that and the instant reaction is, I got a very pessimistic view of the world. How could I have an optimistic view? There's people dying, right? Right. And so it's, it becomes a matter of perspective. Uh, and hope, we want a biblical perspective. Uh, the, so for example, let's, let's transport back to, you know, second, third century. And there's persecution of Christianity all around, you know, the region. People again were dying. But what was also happening? The church was growing. Absolutely. In, say, in, in saying that, we don't dismiss the death. We we grieve over death. We cry right. over it. We, we go to the funerals and we are stunned and saddened by the death. You know, I would imagine that a one who was crucified um, in the second, third century, like there are people just just how could this even how how does God even exist? the questions abound? But the church grew. And so what we got to stop, you know, we have to sit back and ask, can I hold two things true at the same time? Tragedy exists and the mission of God continues to move forward. He will not be stopped. And so when I say I have an optimistic view, it does not remove the suffering that exists, but it's an acknowledgement that God works through the suffering. And he calls the church in particular to be a part of the healing in the midst of suffering. And it's mm -hmm. the church's job locally. Let's take a locally here. It's the right. church's job in Philly or the Moy Metro to be like, all right, how do I participate in God's mission right here, right now? Every city experiences homelessness. That's one we, we both can talk about. How, how can we help those in need? They're hungry. They need clothes. Uh, we partner with a, with a great ministry called Together for Good. Mm -hmm. Free foster care. It's fantastic. That's our little part. We do some other ministry as well. Uh, to the poor and needy, but that's our little part of coming alongside an organization to say, yes, we have an optimistic view that God is doing his work and he's using us to do the work. Now here's some school, school supplies for kids that need them as school starts. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, we get stuck in, I mean, American Christianity is weird in this sense. Mm -hmm. We can't hold two thoughts in our brain at the same time. It drives me nuts sometimes. You know, it's like, it's very singular. It's this and nothing else. And and anything that isn't this is not right. No. Right. We can be optimistic, bigger picture, realizing God is using the church while at the same time acknowledge there is suffering in the world. And um, oftentimes suffering breeds growth. Exponentially, historically speaking, you can see that. And I think, so I want, I want to say something and I want to read something and get you to respond. I think one of the issues we have here compared to, say, China, Africa, many other places where the churches is, is, are growing, is we have a biblically illiterate church and we have many Christians who have an agenda outside of the Bible. 
and therefore God exists, is made in their image based on the scriptures they put together. And not even that all the time. Sometimes it's just God, you know, I, I want to say that God told me this and God gave me this because I can always make God into who I want him to be. But as mm -hmm. soon as I look at what God has promised and who his character is, um, that's going to change things. If you truly understand God's character, I'm going to preach the gospel and with a sense of yeah. urgency and love, yeah. but I'm not going to stop there because mm -hmm. I want to see the love of God um, penetrate the streets of Philadelphia, just like you want in Iowa. Um, but I'm going to do it in such a way, like like the ancient church there, where I'm not giving up, even though yeah. there's persecution, pressure, and people just flat out rejecting what we have to offer. I'm going to keep going because there's something motivating me beyond um, getting enough money on Sunday for the church, and mm -hmm. I know those pressures and all those other things. You you made a statement that I wrote down that I think everybody needs to understand because I think in our context and especially in mine, there is a charismania that's kind of dangerous mm -hmm. where people will say, "God tells me," and I'm not here to fight that. What I'm here to fight is you believe God is speaking to you, and you don't go to God's word. You go to prayer. And it's not informed by, you don't test the spirit, right? right. You, you made this statement, um, you know, when you trust that Holy Scripture is sufficient to explain mm -hmm. God's will for your life, you are experiencing in a tangible way the kingdom of heaven in your life, mm -hmm. right? And so now I can't trust what I don't know. You know, I can't live in, in regards to something that I haven't experienced with. And so we all need a relationship with scripture where when I see what's going on in the news and I can't let go of it, I can go to scripture, understand what scripture says about it, but also I go to God's promises mm -hmm. and know what God is doing about it. And so like we were talking and I'm going to share this info and I, I just want you to give some commentary. Um, we have a situation in Philly where there are cemeteries that are almost full. Um, reaching 90% capacity, mostly teenagers who have been murdered. Mm -hmm. And I know um, believers who love the Lord, who would um, protest, do anything to stop a baby from being aborted, as they okay. should, as we okay. should. Abortion is a horrible, demonic thing. And in my context, I really believe targeted towards African Americans strategically. That's a whole other okay. podcast. Um, but at the same time, um, I don't have to convince any Christians to care about that. Um, what is very hard right. is that people in my context can see what's going on in the news and be so desensitized. And I refuse to believe that desensitization from what you see can overcome the spirit grieving your heart that you didn't even pray about it. Mm -hmm. um, there, in a sense, this is probably going to sound morbid, but I just blow stuff out to you. Abortion is horrible. But I do believe those those souls go to be with God. That's my personal belief. I'm not saying it's good because some people justify it and they say they're just going to heaven. Um, mm -hmm. But when I see young people who I think have just entered depravity and are killing each other, when they get killed, I don't believe they're all going to see the Lord. Mm -hmm. And that troubles me. And I believe it should trouble all of us. Now, I'm not saying you have to cry every day when you wake up. Right. But when I heard this imam on the news talking about it, he says for him, he has to take part in this rite of passage where they have to wash and cleanse ceremony of the bodies. He has an intimacy with every child who dies, even though he didn't know them and they may not have been part of his mosque. And I think in some sense we need mentally to, to wash the dead in the sense that we we understand what's going on, that there are 14, 15 year olds not just getting killed but they're murdering other teenagers, mm -hmm. right? Something changes in you when you can murder for, for things like this. And, and so I just want to get your thoughts on, because you're not affiliated, I'm not asking you to speak for yeah. Philadelphia, but in terms of how Americans process um, theology in the news and in the gospel and works, what do you think is lacking? What do you think needs to happen to change that? Yeah, there's a lot here. And uh, oh yeah, it, it definitely speaks to having an eschatological view of, of caring for the world in which you're in, mm -hmm. right? A deep yeah. care. And, and, and whatever, whatever, whatever stream you're in, you know, however you get there, it, 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 this is really talking about what does it mean to see heaven on earth? I think in a, you know, talk about it in a very more intimate, personal way. When I, when I made the statement of like, you're experiencing the kingdom of heaven, when you go to Holy scripture and Holy scriptures, it, God's word is comforting you. That is mm -hmm. heaven on earth in your life right there. Like you grieve the yeah. death of a friend or a loved one and God meets you. That's heaven on earth in your life right now. 
and that's good. As Christians, I think we experience that an awful lot. That is the kindness and graciousness of God, and uh, and we should we should continue to run toward that. Uh, we don't mm. call it heaven on earth because I don't. I think we've been given different categories that kind of trouble me. But if you think about it, heaven on earth in that way, like when we pray the Lord's prayer, "Thy kingdom come, your will be done." Thy mm. your kingdom come, O God, your will be done in my life. Or, you know, go to you know Psalm twenty three: "The Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want." He makes me lie down in green pastures. I I know everyone loves that psalm. I love that psalm. Yeah. When I am broken. I re I pray, I cry over that Psalm to the Lord and the Lord meets me. Great. That's the kingdom of heaven on earth. Also in a more macro level, you know, the murder rates in Philly, we can also grieve over that and ask Lord, how can we go about seeing heaven on earth in this situation? How do we keep uh, the graveyards from, from seeing more bodies buried there? Yeah. And so what actions do we need to take as a jerk, as a church to see justice? And that could mean getting involved in your local community. It could mean getting involved with, I don't know what the police situations like there in terms of the community and the police. Right. Uh, but whatever it is, what steps are you taking mm -hmm. to, to see injustice thwarted? Because as we look to Holy scripture, and I say biblical justice here, as we look to Holy scripture, God does care for the oppressed and he is angry at oppressors, right? That's biblical language. Now, some people get hung up because that's Marxist language too, but right. Marxist, Marxist stole it from scripture and then he, and then he yeah. twisted it and abused it. Exactly. So we, we, yes. can, we can use the language here and it's just fine. So all it came from out, us first. Yeah, exactly. So all my friends out there who are like, whoa, well, just, just chill out, go read your old Testament, go read Isaiah and call me later. You'll be fine. Right. Um, to your point earlier um, about why why abortion, you know, is celebrated Roe versus Wade being overturned. Yes, and, you know, which thank means, God, but yeah, thank God, and which goes back to the, I would, I I wish the Supreme Court would have gone further. Right? right, I think that I think an unborn baby is a human being, you know, so the Fourteenth mm -hmm. Amendment should apply there. But hey, Roe versus Wade was overturned. I can celebrate that. Right, you know, in part that was overturned because of massive advocacy it's not a favorite term for for me sometimes you know it's a discussion for another day but that's essentially what what's been going on for years there's been grassroots work to see roe versus wade overturned politically speaking yeah what you know we don't need to use neither we don't need to use the word advocacy but we can say grassroots what grassroots work needs to be done in order to see peace on the streets of philly mm -hmm. right it takes local churches getting together and saying how can we do this how can we lock arms yes we may disagree hey. on eschatology you might be a sensationist i might be charismatic but we are all experiencing one thing right now people are dying right in front of our eyes what do we got to do how do we band together and i understand it's easy for me to say that I, that's not lost on me but I would imagine, I don't think those principles apply any different to a different circumstance here in the Des Moines Metro. Right. What are we doing? So it does take action and it, it does take being strategic about that action. Here, what's, what's, what are you left with if you do nothing? More death. Right. And how so does it here, affect our witness for Christ? Correct. And so, so I do thank God um, to see heaven on earth in these situations it means taking action, taking steps, and and just just start with asking the question. Okay, what do we do? And who's who's coming with me? You ever seen Jerry Maguire? He's got like yeah, fish. she's leaving the office. Like, who's coming with me? And that one guy's like, I'm coming with you. Fine, you got one person and a goldfish. Yeah, you can work with that. You know, <laughs> right? There's there's a quote you said. I'm going to read the quote now. Ask you some rapid fire questions. Yeah, but from Kevin De De Young, he he said, in contrasting, I believe it was the kingdom of God and the church. And he said, the kingdom is not the church, but you can't separate the two. Um, the church is the outpost of the kingdom. It's, it's if I quote that right, yeah, um, essentially. It, it's that conduit that God is working through here on earth. And so if we would just change how we see each other, even if we don't do much about how we see the violence, sometimes it starts with seeing our church is not the only church. 
You know what right. I mean? The, right. the Christians that go to our church, is not like we're in this silo, right? There's right. resources in other people. There's power in prayer with other people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes just coming together and saying, what are the issues, you know, or what are the opportunities for us to partner? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you a couple couple questions. And I'll can, be quick. Can, I, can, I, make, can yes. I make a comment on Kevin Young's yes. statement there that I used Please. in the sermon? I used it in part because I thought it was a good statement. And regardless of what camp you're in, you could get mm -hmm. behind that statement. Yeah. Now, what mm -hmm. I didn't say is that I'd actually take the, the statement a little further. Everything, okay. Like everything I just said about the kingdom of heaven on earth, right? Mm -hmm. Personally, within a particular situation, I think applies immensely more for the church. Yeah. Um, so so, so where, where the way I would think about it is he said they, they overlap, right? They overlap. I would say there's more that overlaps that doesn't overlap. I would say there's more that overlaps between the kingdom of heaven here on earth and the church than probably more than what Kevin DeYoung would say. Yeah. So I, li I like his statement at large because I think we all can give the amen, amen, and amen. You, hey, pre-mills, you good? Yeah, amen. You know, all mills yeah. in the back corner, you good? Okay. All you post-mills who are actually going to do the work of the ministry? Just kidding. Amen, you know. Um, no, I'm just kidding on that one part because I do know. But anyways. Thank you for uh, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you're welcome. So for rapid fire. Okay, what would be your 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 exhortations to church leaders who, as I as if, if the statistics I looked up are accurate, um, eschatology is something that's not preached on or incorporated in sermons. There might be Bible studies or there might be books. Um, if if there were leaders, church planters, uh, pastors, elders um, considered, how do we how do we go about this? Should we do a series? Should we? Go sermon them out. Any thoughts that you would uh, give to some young preachers? Yeah, I, I, this is going to sound really silly, but when you actually preach through books of the Bible, you run into eschatology. Mm. You know, you, yeah. like I said, we just ran into it. I, I, the kingdom of heaven shows up all the time in the gospel of Matthew. In the yeah. gospel, Luke and Mark, it's kingdom of God. It's the same thing. It's, it's the same thing. Jewish audience mm -hmm. uh, for Matthew. And I knew that when we got to Matthew, because I've, I'm preparing. I'm planning ahead. And so when we get to Matthew 6, 10, I was going to preach on eschatology. I don't think I used the word eschatology once in my sermon, by the way. I didn't hear it. But I knew that I was preaching on the topic. Yeah. And so I, um, that'd be the first thing. Preach through books and you're going to run into it. If you preach through Old Testament prophets, you're going to bump into it a lot. Um, mm -hmm. You're going to hear the, the language of last days, right? Um mm -hmm in that day all that kind of language is is bending toward eschatology and the reason why i like this approach is because we can overly systematize eschatology here's what i mean wing, wing grudem becomes the only system of eschatology <laughs> right you mm -hmm. read it and uh, there's a place for systematic theology right. right there is a place for it but I think taking our cues first from scripture and, and, and dealing with it as we engage scripture is a much healthier way to creating a, uh, an eschatological system. Here's the second thing I would say. Figure out where you agree with all these broad cam camps, right? We all agree that Jesus is returning. Uh, we celebrate the Lord's Supper every single Sunday at Redemption Hill. And you go to, you go to 1 Corinthians 11 and you use that text that's in 1 Corinthians 11. And it says after the bread and the juice, uh, we use juice, uh, that Jesus is going to come back. And mm -hmm. I think it's always good to remind ourselves we all agree upon that. And now we're just we're just kind of debating over okay, millennium, you know, Revelation twenty. And that's a good debate to have. Yeah. Are, are, could you do a sermon series in eschatology? Absolutely. Um, I, I th my concern is it turns into a systematic theology class. Yeah. And so all your all your seminary nerds out there are gonna be like, this is great. And then everyone else is like, Yeah, but what does this mean for my life? And certainly there are implications for what does it mean for my life. But you run a risk of, you know, sounding like a professor, not a pastor. Mm. And so maybe, maybe if you do eschatology in a more formal setting, you do a, a class at church. Sure. I'm okay with that. Okay. How about this? Yeah. You got a Christian. Come to church, heard your sermon. Um, it speaks to them. 
they're thinking through. I grew up pre-millennial. Uh, you know, I don't know what to do with this, but I do see all the issues around. I want to. I want to be motivated. I want to understand um, Christ's reign. What do I do? Should I go get some books? Should I just read Scripture, First Corinthians fifteen, and Revelation twenty? What What do you tell them they should do? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think every situation is different. It's not a cop out. It really isn't. I think it's mm -hmm. knowing who you're speaking with. Mm -hmm. If it's like um, a young guy, he just went to Bible college, and he's like, "Dude, you're saying some things. It's awesome. I'm not quite sure what to do with it, but I'm with you." You know, then mm -hmm. I'm going to pull like one of those three, four view, view books. You know, and be like, "All right, here's yeah. three, four view books of whatever." Or I might give him Sandum Storms Kingdom Come," or I might give mm -hmm. him a. You know, a book by Jim Hamilton, who's a pre-mill guy, or I might give a book by a post-mill guy. You know, go read Edwards, who is post-millennial, right? What, what, what I want to do in almost all situations is foster um, thinking, curious thinking. Mm -hmm. I, I want people to be curious about what the Bible says about these particular topics and how it leads them to Jesus. So curious right. thinking that leads people to Christ. That's, that's what I try to do. And that could be different if like you have like a, you know, an older person who's for their whole lives, they're like been pre-mill dispensational and they come to your church and they're like, I've been in a fundamentalist Baptist church my entire life. And everything you said just doesn't make sense to me. Right. I'll probably give a, a book on everything I just said, <laughs> you know, and say, all right, here's a book. Here's, here's, here's the terminology. Here's what I'm getting at. And then engage that way. So it's not a cop out to say there's not one specific way to approach it. I think it's actually a pastoral way to say you meet people where they're at and you're patient mm -hmm. with them and you foster that curious intellectual endeavor that lead them, that leads them to Jesus. I like that. In, in other words, you could really say, however you process it, don't do it in isolation. Yeah, don't take absolutely. your bias at home and find, I'm going to look up somebody to, you know, because I've seen some people say, I used to be premillennial. Now I'm sending all the Sam Storm messages and all that or Kim yeah. Rillabarger's book to my old pastor. Don't do that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there's the wrong way to read eschatology, right? Yes. Don't don't try to process all the numerology and the number 10 and the market of beasts and all this <laughs> stuff. Because what happens is what, what God is really doing here is teaching you to identify your own bias and your own ignorance. Mm -hmm. areas where you need worship. I think mm -hmm. if anything, no matter That's which right. of those ways you mention, um, I want to be able to read it in such a way that my heart sings for Christ. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, I got a problem. Maybe I need yeah. to stop for a minute and go back to the gospel of John or, mm -hmm. or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. It should, yeah. you should have stronger confidence. You should have. And one thing I think is you should read through the lens of those who were reading it at the time. We mm -hmm. always try to bring things to now. And yeah. we don't read at the time it's written. We don't sit with John on Patmos mm -hmm. and, and consider all the other apostles are dead. Christians are being persecuted. Here's what God is sending, you know, through all this persecution and, um, you know, read it in that sense. So I'm not talking about being emotional, but process it with your pastor, mm -hmm. process it with other Christians, right? And just don't have a hobby horse. Just say, yeah. I'm going for hope and help. And how does this speak to us? And I think God will show up in yeah. ways you don't expect because you got to be yeah. willing to say, I could be wrong, yeah. right? And I love saying, I don't know for certain things. Other yeah. stuff, I'm like, I know, but I don't want to talk to you about it because I don't want to make you stumble because yeah. you're going to struggle. Here's what I also I would say to a leader. It's it's okay to be like, I'm wrestling with this on some, on some tertiary theological doctrines. And you know what? It shows a little bit of humility. Yeah. It, what's, what's worse to me is be like, I am... X, Y, Z is my eschatological position. Why? Well, I really haven't thought much about it. I would rather have, if I was a, if I was a member of a church, I would rather have a pastor who's willing to engage in the theological discussion to think well about theology as opposed to, uh, well, you know, this is just what's in our statement of faith. So, so I called it good. I, I, I we, hmm. Er, er. Lazy, thinking, man. <laughs> Lazy thinking really bugs me. It really does. Yes. Especially when people are looking at you as a leader, a as a That's leader, right. like they're looking to you. I mean, in a sense, this isn't necessarily should be, sh this shouldn't, shouldn't be the case, but people are like, you're supposed to know all the things, man, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, it's good to be like, you know what? I'm wrestling and I don't know all the things, but I'm not giving up on knowing the things. So the journey oh, yeah. is just as important as the end sometimes.
I like that a lot. I, and, and that would be my admonishment to particularly men, but all, all believers. You can't mm-hmm. afford to be a lazy thinker in today's times because no. everybody is trying to give you something to believe and something to worship. You, you go on Instagram be, and it's free because you're a commodity. You go on Twitter because you can be advertised to. And mm-hmm. everybody wants to influence how you think, feel, and act. And so you need to think deeply. I would rather have somebody be confessional than eschatological. Yeah. I would rather have you yeah, analyze where you are on a on a confession before you know where you are in Revelation 20, because mm-hmm. it's probably because you want to have fun, but maybe not. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But I'd rather have you there because you need to define where you are. Because I see people who are conflicted. You know, you just read some Instagram bios and you know it says Jesus first, and then you have mm-hmm. Pisces, and then half your profile pick is your butt um, for, <laughs> for girls. I don't know any guys who've done that, but there probably are at least two. Yeah. And so we need to really line up what I believe and how I believe it. Um, yeah. Last question for you. Yeah. If we could get in a time machine, if God would allow us to go back to to young Sean Powers who just got saved, um, yes. would you give him any admonishment? Is there any exhortations, help, books, advice that you would give him um, in his walk? Specifically in his walk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, a couple a couple background thoughts, and then I'll give the advice. When the Lord saved me, I was out, I was out of a hot mess, and I know it's part of your story as well. Mm-hmm. And um, a lot of, a lot of sin. And I think what I realized, now that I'm older, is that I should have taken my sin more seriously right away. Mm. Right? Wow, you know it's, it, it, you know you get saved and it was like ah this is amazing and but there was also the sense of like okay how seriously do i really want to take my sin so i guess the first piece of advice would be repent mm. repent repent of your sin and then and then go to scripture and be like okay how is god calling me to live because the last thing you want to be in that moment right as a as a new christian is um one who's professing the faith right but you're mm-hmm. living really in hypocrisy so yeah. repentance is repentance is a fruit I believe of the Christian faith and uh, we need to practice it well and we need to continue to practice that well not just Sean Powers and he was you know you know 22 but Sean Powers and he's 42 how old am I I don't know 41 42 you're just older than me right yeah you're close to 41 I don't mean I don't care <laughs> <laughs> so repentance is really important I, I, for me at the time I would have I would have told Sean Powers of old to stop dating. Okay. Take a chill pill. And that's me. Um I know of the missionary dating and they get married and, and it turns out happily ever after. That's fine. For me, I, I just should have stopped cold and be like, I can't date. I gotta I gotta get my heart right before the Lord. Because because you know, you when you've been living a particular way and you experienced all the the stuff of that old way and the Lord saves you, and all of a sudden it's like you can't, you're telling me I can't have that, and you're going to put yourself in a position with with someone that you're quote you know dating. Um, that I, it was just I, for me, it was like I should have just stopped and be like, nope, I'm going to spend the next one year or whatever. I'm doing the Paul thing, you know. I'm going, I'm getting out of town for a while, and um, really going to focus on the Lord. I, I wish I would have done more of focusing on the Lord um, in my heart uh, more than anything else. And another thing I would say is get into a church. My preference is reformed, a reformed church, but mm. you know I understand if it's not your favorite thing. But get into a church where the gospel is being preached. It's clear mm. every single Sunday, in one way or another. The go- it is clear through music, through the preaching of the word. Perhaps they celebrate communion every Sunday. Whatever the case might be, it is clear that the gospel of Jesus Christ is evident in that place, and. I would also say that your pastor preaches expositional sermons. Yes. Now, that seems very narrow, and I agree. It is very I'll take narrow. it. Yeah, 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 exactly. And I would say reformed as well, and that's even more narrow. <laughs> but define that, though. What's, what's the expositional sermon? Yeah, I, I, I think it's briefly. good. Yeah, briefly. I think it's good. A, an expositional sermon is a preaching style in which a pastor goes through texts of the Bible. Uh, this can be compared to topical preaching. So instead of, you know, I'm going to come up on Sunday, a topical sermon might be, 
I'm preaching on the love of God. And so usually within that topical sermon, you have the pastor pulling 10 texts about the love of God and putting it into his sermon and giving you five ways to apply it. Mm -hmm. Topical sermon. Expositional preaching actually forces you, I think, to do actually a lot of heart work and head work. You actually have to get into the nitty gritty of the text. You really have to slow down and ask the question, what is God saying here? And what yeah. does this mean for my life? And so you deal with the text on its terms and not your terms. Um, I heard once heard Andy Stanley say that expositional preaching was, it was easier than topical preaching. I think that's a bunch of crap. Yeah, I don't agree. <laughs> don't agree at all. Not at all. And, and the litmus test is just go listen to preachers. Yeah. You can have people preach, you can have pastors preach and they'll never open their Bible and, and quote, a, yeah. quote a Bible passage. I, that happened one time when I was in seminary, I visited a church and it was in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Sharice and I go, it was recommended and we, and we listen and it was a, a business sermon about how to be a good in the workplace or whatever. Oh, wow. It, on the one hand, preach on vocation. Absolutely. Like there's a lot we can say about vocation and scripture is really clear about that. On the other hand, he never opened the Bible. Oh, wow. And I'm just kind of like, is this a business seminar or a sermon? Right. And so I think expositional preaching is so helpful for your soul. That's why. At the end of the day, you're getting God's word. You're getting more of God's word and a whole lot less of Sean Powers. Wow, that was good. I need like the hand clapping sound or DJ Clues bombs. Oh, you don't know what <laughs> DJ Clues bombs are. Nope. Oh man, like Funk Master Flex. I need that. See, man, I could have urbanized you and had the bomb. I failed you, bro. Oh, oh no. everybody who's listening is imagining DJ Clues bombs dropping. I'm gonna get that so we can use it on your podcast for you. Here's the deal: you can do it. You can edit it or put it in post text. You just got or post really. Edit. Oh yeah, you just got to figure out how. It's easy. Give them uh, your social media and definitely tell us about Cornfield Theology. I know, but, and if you don't mind, yeah. I'll link to your sermon in this video. Yeah, yeah certainly. Go ahead. I mean, Sean underscore DSM on Twitter. Uh, I will say this about Twitter. It is a dumpster fire on uh, going down the river. And uh, there you go. Uh, yeah, that's what I think. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. I'm on Instagram or they call it IG. I don't know. I'm a yeah. on IG. So. But uh, I do a lot of blogging and podcasting, like you mentioned, on cornfieldtheology.com. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's been fun. That's been the way I approach cornfieldtheology.com. It's theology from the cornfields, but it's another way for me to teach our church. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things I get to say on Sunday morning, and I love it. Um, also, there are things that come up throughout culture in the world where I don't necessarily want to pause to address it on Sunday. Maybe sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. I can do a blog or a podcast, or like we've done before, Eric, you and I, there's mm -hmm. a particular subject that we want, a topic, you know, you think about topical yeah. sermons, that's actually a great way to do topical stuff. Yep. It's just sitting down and be like, hey, here's what we are thinking about church planning or, or eschatology or whatever. So you can sign up for those emails if you want them. I don't spam you, but whenever anything drops, just go to, you know, cornfieldtheology.com, put your email in at the bottom of the page and it'll, it'll send you an email. I don't even know if your generation does email, but who knows? Probably not. And if they look for it on YouTube, I learned there's a lot of Redemption Hills out there. Yeah. So there's a lot of designer imposters. They got to find the right one. That's the yeah. other thing, too, because people were looking for you. I was like, look for Redemption Hill. And they're like, oh, I saw this other guy. I'm like, that's not the same white guy. Nope. Yeah. Find the other white one. Guy. <laughs> find the other one. It's a black and white, uh, black and yellow logo with a cross. Uh, Redemption Hill DSM dot org is a church website. So if that's helpful, I would uh, go ahead and look at that. Yeah, and not to replace anybody's pastor, but if you want to hear some sermons and you want to know expository preaching, um, listen to Pastor Sean's sermons. Um, not to compare with your own pastor, but just yeah. to figure out what should be in your diet. You know, we, we we really need to take hold of our pursuing our sanctification Monday through Saturday. And so yeah. um, it's good. I enjoyed the sermon from yesterday. I would encourage anybody, go grab it, listen to it, take notes, and um, and share it with other people. It, not necessarily the message, but what you learn. Teach somebody. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you're if you're a husband or father out there and you're trying to lead your family devotional, read some stuff from song sermon. Follow along in a sermon and amount and talk to your family about each different verse each week. It's just a little bit. And sometimes that's all it takes to have a really good conversation with your family. I would say to men in closing, I'll probably say this a lot, two things you could do for your family this week that are great. Have dinner at the table, cut the TV yeah. off, cut the phones off yeah. and talk. <laughs> talk yeah. to one another, talk about Jesus, talk about school, talk about life, talk about how good God has been. Yeah. Um, 
you sit at the head of your table and you lead and love and shepherd your family well. And if you want, you can, you know, Sermon on the Mount, Revelation 20, whatever, read scripture. Even if you don't understand the interpretation, read it. Um, yeah. As Steve Lawson would say, read it and read it again. Mm -hmm. um, any final words from you, Sean? Final words. Well, I would say this uh, to specifically to men, because I think that's just an area that you're extremely passionate about. Yes. Fellas, don't give up hope. Mm. Continue to press in your relationship with God. Be active in your faith. If you're married, lead your, uh, serve your wife well. And be sacrificial. Sacrificial could mean providing in ways that, let's just say, are not your favorite. But you do it because it, you love her. That's right. Be like Christ. Be Christ to her. Be the example that Christ has called you to be. And when it comes to raising your kids, love them. If you've got daughters in particular, tell them they're beautiful. Mm. Tell them that you love them. And when you've wronged them, ask for forgiveness. Model the Christian faith to them. If you're raising boys, I'm telling you right now, you've got to prepare them for this world. You've got to prepare them to live in such a way to combat hostility, um, right. to, 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 to live in such a way where they're actually going to take ground as a Christian man and not constantly give it up. And that means fighting for faith, fighting against sin. And when you do that, what you, what you realize, you are salty to the people around you. And people are going to be like, whoa, he's doing things a little bit differently or a lot differently. I wonder why. And it's because of Christ in you. So fight the good fight of faith. Don't give up. That's amazing. Profound wisdom. Um, you guys heard it here. Pastor Sean Powers, the one and only. Um, until next time on our next episode, we'll probably talk about incels and esports <laughs> and the women who love them. So until next time, everybody.